OK, we've looked at why AI is so important and how that happened. We've explored why it's going to become much, much more important in the decades ahead. Now I'll suggest some ways that that will impact education. Education will be one of the areas where artificial intelligence will have the biggest impact. This is partly because learning is so important and also partly because our current provision often leaves a lot to be desired. Classrooms today would be recognisable to the Victorians who invented them. And a few decades from now, we may look back on this period as the final years of the pedagogical dark ages. Some would even say that schools today are abusive. Sitting still and quiet in military ranks for hours at a time is the absolute opposite of what children are hardwired to do. As Donald Clark, the co-founder of the Epic Group, says, education is a bit of a slow learner. This is not generally the fault of teachers. They are the active ingredient in today's education system, but they're expensive and not scalable, which is unfortunate because we expect them to scale. We expect them to educate 30 students at a time. To educate a student, you need to inspire them, and it is not easy to inspire 30 students at the same time. Think back to your own school days. How many of your teachers were positively inspirational? As many as 10%? If so, you were lucky. A number of tools are already available to improve the situation. With flipped lessons, students watch a video of a lecture for homework, and there's no reason why it can't be the best lecture ever given on the subject. And then they put what they've been told into practice in the classroom. The teacher acts as coach and mentor, a much more interactive role than lecturing. Mastery learning or competency-based learning requires students to have mastered a skill or a lesson before they move on to the next one. Students within a class may progress at different speeds and your educational stage is not rigidly determined by your age. As Sal Khan, the, the founder of Khan Academy, points out, this means that everyone should get an A in every subject. We could be doing more to gamify the learning process and to turbocharge it by having learners teach each other and learn from each other. And of course, there's online learning which is still young and must improve. To quote Epic Group's Donald Clark again, online learning projects are like mosquitoes, lots of buzz, tricky to spot, and short-lived. Until a couple of years ago, my partner was a director at London's leading interior design college. She spent a decade pioneering online and blended learning there. When COVID struck, like most educational institutions, it had to close its doors to students. During those Easter holidays, they switched the entire school to online delivery. It was a huge challenge, but it worked. And not only did it ensure the college's own ongoing success, but it also demonstrated to both staff and students that online learning has a number of positive advantages over the traditional in-person variety. As she says, conventional wisdom says that online learning is characterized by isolation, plagiarism, low retention rates, shallow learning, poor quality teaching materials and meaningless qualifications. Some of this was true in the past, but increasingly it's simply wrong. But all of this will pale into insignificance compared with the impact of AI. AI will make past improvements in pedagogy look like rounding errors. In the near term, bots, software robots, will take over an increasing range of education related activities, including the recruitment of students, onboarding them in schools and universities, reminding and cajoling them to submit casework, assessing some of their work, and even providing a certain amount of Socratic tuition. A few years ago, IBM built a teaching assistant robot named Jill Watson. Students at Georgia Tech, a computing college, were guinea pigs in an experiment to see whether they would notice that one of their nine teaching assistants was a robot. Interestingly, when they finally twigged that she was too efficient to be human, they weren't annoyed. Instead, they recommended her for a teaching award. Jill Watson was a digital assistant, 
and many of us have had access to primitive versions of these for some time already. They look like this. But Siri, like its friends Alexa, Cortana and Google Assistant, was pretty dumb. It could answer a simple question, but it couldn't sustain a conversation. And we can now see how that's going to change. Generative pre-trained transformers, or GPTs, will enable the creation of digital assistants that you can have conversations with and send off into the internet to do errands for you. They will allow companies to build personal teaching assistants which have an encyclopedic knowledge of the curricul curriculum we need to master and they will understand better than we do which approach to learning suits us best, which times of day we're most receptive and which times we're best left to relax or rest. When will all this happen? At this point, we need to bring in an American scientist called Roy Amara. There's a law named after Roy, which says that we overestimate the short-term impact of new technologies and underestimate their long-term impact. Whenever a new technology is introduced, we think its impact will be immediate and in a straight line, like the orange line here. We forget about the time that it takes everyone to have a cup of coffee, learn about the technology, have another cup of coffee, and gradually figure out how to take advantage of it. By the time the adoption gets started, we've all got bored and we're dismissing it as hype. So we're not paying attention when the steep part of the growth curve kicks in, the green line here. Unfortunately, we never know how long the long term is. Sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's 15 years or even longer. Before GPT was launched, my guess was that we would have advanced digital assistance by 2030. Now, I think it'll be considerably sooner. So that's the near term. In the longer term, thanks to AI, education will be less regimented, more flexible, and much more closely tailored to our individual preferences and needs. And above all, it'll be more fun. One of the reasons this will happen is virtual reality and augmented reality. It'll be much more compelling to learn about Napoleon by experiencing the Battle of Waterloo rather than by reading about it or listening to a lecturer describe it. It'll be much easier for a teacher to explain the molecular structure of alcohol by escorting her pupils around a VR model of it. Perhaps the greatest gift that AI will bring to learning is personalization. Really advanced digital assistants will be both tutors and companions, like Aristotle was to Alexander the Great. And they'll find you as endlessly fascinating as you find yourself. Unfortunately, none of this will make learning trivially easy. Until we have advanced brain-computer interfaces, we won't be able to simply upload knowledge and skills into our minds like Leo learning Kung Fu in The Matrix. Elon Musk is working on this kind of thing with his company Neuralink, but he's surely over-optimistic in thinking that anything like that will be available in the next decade or two. We will still have to practice active recall to establish and strengthen memory. Let's finish by looking at a development you read about all the time, but its enormous implications for education are rarely considered. Robots taking our jobs if the exponential growth in the power of our computers, and hence our AI, does continue for two or three more decades, then it's pretty much inevitable that machines will do all the jobs. That's because machines will be able to do pretty much everything that humans can do for money. Cheaper, faster, and better than humans can. A lot of people are in denial about this, but that's mostly because they're not taking the impact of exponential growth seriously. And that is potentially dangerous complacency. It's also pessimistic. A world in which machines do all the jobs could be a world in which humans do whatever they want to do. Learning, playing, exploring, socialising, creating, having fun. We could have a second renaissance. Of course, this raises a lot of questions and a lot of challenges. I've explored them in detail in this book. In this book, I propose a system called Fully Automated Luxury Capitalism. There isn't time now to explain what that is or how to achieve it. You can, of course, buy the book and find out. But in a system of fully automated luxury capitalism, 
education will become even more important than it is today. Instead of viewing education largely as a route into the world of work, we will view it as a way to make the most of life in general, which is, of course, is what most educators want it to be already. So maybe in the future, when you meet somebody in a party, maybe instead of asking what they do for a living, you'll ask them what they're learning. Education in that world will be vacational and not vocational.